Nellie? Okay. Good morning, everyone. The Reverend Maureen Walter will be with us in a few moments. She was turned around a few times by the police uh, as the marathon has closed a lot of roads for us. So let us begin our worship this morning. Good morning again, and the Reverend Maureen Walter will be with us in a few moments. Let us begin our service this morning with the call to worship, which is on the bulletin that you picked up this morning. O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The works praise your name in earth and sky and sea. Our help is in the name of the Lord, made heaven and earth. Let us worship God. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 814, Morning Has Broken, uh, and we will sing all three verses.
And we will now turn it over to the Reverend Maureen Walter, who has made it, and we give her a second or two to get organized with a speaker, which is important. <coughs> My apologies. Sorry, folks. I was turned back four different times on the way here with uh, the marathon and my route map kept telling me where to go. That wasn't the right way. So, I think we're ready to start with prayer, and I think I'm about ready to have a little prayer, too. So let's pray together. O oh Lord, you are our God, and we who worship you must worship in spirit and in truth. Through your great love, we are able to find your presence within our hearts and know that wherever we are, you are there also. And we ask that you would lead us and protect us, O oh Lord, that you would create a pure heart within us and give us a new and steadfast spirit. Do not drive us from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from us, but help us to always feel you near, to know your comforting touch, and to feel your guidance and love. Let us walk in your light in every way, and let us perform what you have asked, to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with you, our Lord and our God. In the name of Christ our Lord and Savior we pray, amen. And be assured that in the mercy and love of God, we are a forgiven people, this day is a new day and a fresh start for each one of us. Amen. Uh, we have uh, Psalm 23. And uh, when I turn to Psalm 23, it actually suggests that we read it in unison. Is my shepherd I shall not want the Lord makes me lie down in green pastures leads me beside still waters restores my soul and leads me in right paths for the sake of the Lord's name Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for the length of my days. Thank you. Our Old Testament lesson is from the prophet Isaiah, 
at chapter 25, verses 1 to 9, and it is on page 738 of the Pew Bibles. Listen for the word of God. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name, for in perfect faithfulness you have done marvelous things, things planned long ago. You've made the city a heap of rubble, the fortified town a ruin, the foreigners' stronghold a city no more, it will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will honor you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. You have been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm, and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall, and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners, as heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is stilled. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations, he will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And then in the epistles, we read from Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 9, and it's on page 1231. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Sintik to agree with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, royal, loyal yoke fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, pre present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And Julie Gangadeen, one of our session members, will read the gospel lesson. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Today's gospel is from Matthew, chapter 22, verses 1 to 14, and it can be found in your pew Bibles on page 1033. 
the parable of the wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and buried, burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. So go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, the bad as well as the good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in and see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes, friend? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and garnishing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. We're going to sing hymn number 441, Can a Little Child Like Me?
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. Amen. Today in Matthew's Gospel, we read the parable of the wedding banquet. This is one of the harshest parables in the Bible, as certainly in the Gospels. The story is shockingly unforgiving. A king gives a wedding banquet for his son. The king sends his servants to call the guests, but they will not come. The king sends other servants with a more pointed message. The dinner is prepared. The oxen and fatted calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. It is time for the guests to come to the wedding banquet. The invited guests refuse. One goes to his farm, another goes to his business. The rest seize the servants, mistreat them, and kill them. The king is enraged by the rejection of his invitation. He sends his troops in, kills the murderers, and burns their city, raising it to the ground. Nothing is left of those invited guests at all. Dismissively, he tells his servants those guests were unworthy. He sends the servants into the main streets to invite everyone they find, both good and bad, into the banquet. The servants go into the streets to gather everyone they find, whoever they are. Soon the wedding hall is filled with guests eating and drinking. The king walks through the hall to greet the guests. He's shocked to see one of the guests is not wearing wedding robes. The king asks the man how he got in without a wedding robe. The man has no answer. The king has the guest bound hand and foot and cast out into the outer darkness where there will be only weeping and gnashing of teeth. The worthy people of Israel, the religious leaders and Pharisees, are like the murderous guests who ignore the king's invitation and then kill the messengers who bear the invitation. The message is clear. They will be utterly destroyed for their refusal to answer God's call. The guests who are called to the banquet but refuse to attend have no respect for the king. They believe they do not need, <coughs> that they don't need the king's power or influence. They have better things to do than pay homage. They're too busy managing their own affairs. Their refusal causes them to be destroyed. This parable is not a comforting story for the religious people of Jesus' day, nor for ours. In the parable, after the worthy ones are destroyed, everyone else, regardless of their rank or behavior, is invited to the banquet. However, even those who do attend must respect the kingdom. The guest without a wedding robe is also cast out. They too must show their respect for the king and the banquet. It's hard to recall a parable with harsher warnings. 
The choices are only full respect and eagerness to accept the invitation or death. Take part, participate fully, or be destroyed. There's no comforting middle ground. As a member of Presbytery, if I'm unable to attend a duly called meeting, I send my regrets. The court acknowledges that I have fulfilled my obligations by responding, acknowledging my duty. God's invitation to the kingdom banquet has no such easy out. Either we're in or we are not. We are to come to the kingdom of God and to serve the Lord when asked to do so. We create a harsher world when we refuse to respond to God's invitation to serve. The parable is speaking to the life of the soul. If we reject the invitation to the wedding feast, we prevent ourselves from participating in the life of the soul. The warning is dire, and it's directed toward the faithful, the ones who think they might be more righteous than others. Good reputation does nothing for us in the kingdom of the banquet. We need to respond. We good church members need to serve God. We answer God's call and rely on God if we wish to be seated at the banquet. Doing what we can, where we can, that's the only way I know to overcome the dire warning of the parable. We respond to God's call, and then we enjoy the banquet. We respond to God's call. We hear and believe God's message. Throughout the history of Judeo-Christianity, the call has always been the same to serve God, to seek justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Every prophet calls for action, justice, love, mercy. We attend the banquet not simply so we can enjoy the benefits of justice and mercy, but so that everyone lives under these conditions. We serve God when we serve community. The world is undergoing extremely harsh conditions. As war and terrorism rages, economies suffer. Housing, food sufficiency, fair employment, they're worldwide issues in crisis. We hear the voices of concern raised in our own city. It's up to us to share the kingdom of God as we are able. This week, I spoke at length with someone who is passionate about providing safe and accessible housing for those in dire need. It inspired me. Our mission is not just about words but about doing what we can to serve the needs of God's kingdom. And by serving God's kingdom, I do not mean merely we respond to those who believe in God the way we believe in God. God made all people, and all are to be shown the love and compassion, all of it, that we're able to show. Our care and our concern is needed The life of the soul that we strive for has a framework. It's found in the greatest commandment, to love the Lord our God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself, for they are as you are. 
Jesus said all the laws and the prophets were fulfilled by the greatest commandment. Those who wish to live a full soul life must use the command to love God and neighbor as their guide. We're invited to participate in this life with love. We live in God, so we live in love. It sounds nice, but it calls for action. It's inconvenient to love God and neighbor. We have many distractions. Business is pressing. People need to work to earn a living. It's easy to believe we do not need to answer God's call, at least not today. Therein lies the mistake of the parable that cost the worthy guests their place at the table. In the kingdom of God, we're called to act in love. Whether we pray for our neighbor or shovel their walk, love is expressed in the command to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. In the past few decades, people questioned the relevance of church. I don't need to go to church, people would say something like, I feel God's presence when I walk in the forest, not sitting through some boring service. Sometimes that, there might be some truth in that. But the thought lacks a dimension. In church, we build community. Today's parable tells us that our command to love the community is as vital to our life of the soul as our call to experience God's presence in our most private moments. It's not just that I am saved by the blood of Christ. It is that God so loved the world, he gave his only son that we might live. Our faith is like the cross. The vertical line shows us connecting to God, each person being loved fully, individually. The horizontal line, the crossbar, shows us connected in community by love to each other. We're not called to do lip service to the idea of love for all. We're called to do everything we can to bring God's love to one another. When we feel God with us and demonstrate God's love and community, we live in the kingdom of God. We feast at the banquet. Amen. I think we have an anthem.
Thank you very much. And uh, thanks everybody for being here. Um, session met this week and we decided uh, that we would make a few changes in our COVID protocol. So I'm not sure if some or all of them are being instituted today, but we're no longer going to ask people to sign in. Uh, we were doing that because there was a time when uh, public health wanted us to keep track in case they needed to contact people in case of an outbreak. And they're not tracing like that at the moment. Um, of course, things can always go back to a more uh, tighter protocol, but uh, since, since that's, there's no reason we're not making you sign in. We're not requiring masks. I believe they're still available at the back of the church, and if they're not, we'll make sure there are. And we still, of course, encourage social distancing, which isn't too difficult in our large and spacious church. And we're going to return to uh, passing the offering plate. Now, are we planning to do that today or next week? So today, after the announcements, we're going to pass the offering plates. We haven't done it in a while. We'll uh, come to the front uh, with the plates. And if you've already put your money in the plate, that is totally fine. Don't worry about anything. And um, then we'll sing the doxology, see if we remember how. I'm pretty sure it's 830 in the hymn book. And then we'll have our offering prayer, and then we'll um, proceed uh, after that with our regular service. So that's a bit of a change, and I think we'll all enjoy getting back to some of our uh, regular routines. Uh, this morning is the uh, Toronto Scotia Bank uh, Marathon, and uh, some of our members have participated. Some of our members participated this morning. Wonderful. And last week we said, that's so cool. I was thinking, how are you here? Of course, you already did it and you came. Woohoo! That's wonderful. And you're uh, supporting Matthew's House and Evangel Hall. And we sent out links last week. I think I forgot to put them in yesterday, but we'll send them out again this week link so that you can support that fundraising work our young people have been doing and uh, some of us are still planning to do a virtual walk uh, we, as long as we do it before the end of the month in support of the same project so we're really thrilled that that uh, took place that's wonderful and uh, you'll have to show us all the medals at uh, coffee after the service Next week after the service, there is a meeting of the Music and Sanctuary Committee, and uh, people may be interested to uh, get a little bit of an update, so you're welcome to attend if you want part or all of the meeting. And we will have a light lunch so that people can have a bite while they're talking. Uh, also, we are uh, going to make a few changes in November. We realize that we're celebrating Remembrance Day on November 5th because that's the Sunday closest to the 11th, before the 11th, and we have booked a trumpeter, is my understanding. But we'd also plan communion that day. That will make, I think, for a very lengthy service. So the session just uh, last night has decided that we will have um, Remembrance Day on the 5th. We'll wait for the 12th to have communion and then we'll celebrate um, anniversary on the 19th. So November will be a, a great month. We'll look forward to it with lots of great things going on. And on a sadder note, uh, we have uh, found out when Bill King's uh, graveside burial will happen. It will be at the Necropolis Cemetery on Saturday, October 28th at 1 p.m. My understanding is the Necropolis Cemetery is uh, close to Riverdale Farm and probably known to many of you. Uh, we're all invited to attend if we wish. Um, and uh, uh, we'll um, mark, uh, remember our dear friends, uh, uh, 
life and witness in the world. Uh, those are all of the announcements I have at the moment. Am I missing any that anyone remembers? One o'clock in the afternoon. And that'll be in the cemetery itself. I'm hoping that maybe beforehand they'll give me a bit of a map so that I know where in the cemetery his, his uh, plot is, because I don't know that yet. Uh, and so we'll let you know, um, assuming we get that. So, we will proceed with our offering. Thank you. We thank you for all our many gifts, O oh Lord. We thank you for the abundance that you have given to us. We pray that as we share these gifts, that your word, your light, and your love would spread forth through our community and all the world. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you. Thank you. We'll continue our service in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, we give thanks for your goodness and love towards us, for the joy of home and family, for the companionship of friends and neighbors for the opportunity to love and serve our community, for the activities, the jobs, the hobbies, the tasks we have which fulfill our lives, for the strength that supports us, the hand that reaches for ours when we need comfort, the helpful deed that makes our lives easier and the helpful deed that we are able to do to share your love with someone else. We thank you, O oh Lord, when we feel joyful, but we also thank you when we are troubled or afraid, so we know it is a chance to turn to you and find your guidance, your comfort, your love. We give thanks that we have the ability to feel in our hearts all the emotions of the world. 
that we live this life knowing that you are with us in each and every step. We give thanks for your Son, Jesus Christ, and for the glory of his humble birth, for how he walked on earth and so understands our joys, our troubles, our worries, and our pain. We thank you for your Holy Spirit at work in our world, but especially at work in our hearts, revealing your truth, renewing our lives, bringing us to your eternal kingdom, that we might always feast at the banquet with you. God of love and power, as we listen to the news and hear of the extreme difficulties faced by so many in the world, we pray that somehow we might work towards peace, towards justice, towards mercy, and that whatever corner of the world we might inhabit, we would shine for you and help to ease the suffering of others. We give thanks that through the courage and faith of your people, your word, your life, your love may be preached and lived. And we give thanks for our opportunities to serve you wherever we go and however we are called. We pray for all those who are in trouble. We pray for those who are sick that they may be cared for, nurtured and healed. We pray for those who are lonely, that they may be comforted, sustained, and find their place in community. We pray for those who are oppressed, that justice may ring out, and that they may be strengthened, and that we might help them to find a better world. We thank you and pray for those who need your comfort. We especially remember those who mourn, and we ask that you would help us to find our faith, that they live in you through your great glory and gift of eternal life. We give thanks, O Lord, for the great cloud of witnesses by who we are compassed about, those who served you who inspired us, who loved us and taught us, and who still surround us in your glorious kingdom, which is here and forever. And we pray that we might follow their example and come to share with them the glory of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit is worshipped and glorified forever. And we wrap up our prayers with these and so many other thoughts that we have for you by praying together as we have been taught, saying, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 324, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
are the mustard seed planted by God to grow and thrive that all might know the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you now and forevermore.